Addiction is an aspect of the human condition that's probably going to affect everyone in this room, either directly or indirectly. Depending on the personal experiences we have in our lives with addiction, or the experiences that one of our loved ones has with addiction, we can come up with all sorts of different rationalizations to explain why addictive behaviors take place. Okay, so we can think of addiction as a bad habit. So something that we've fallen into due to circumstances in our lives beyond our control. Maybe addiction is just a personal choice. Is addiction maybe a moral failing? Is it due to some sort of intrinsic personality flaw? More recently, we've been thinking about addiction in terms of it being a disease state. Now, I'm a neuroscientist. I've been studying the neurobiology of addiction for almost 20 years now. And I've come to appreciate the importance of how we conceptualize addiction because it really addresses how we approach the issue of addiction in terms of our research and in terms of how we treat people that are suffering from addiction. Now, the disease model of addiction is probably one that everyone in this room is familiar with. It sort of thinks of addiction as being an organic brain state, sort of akin to what we think of typical brain diseases like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. It's also suggesting that addiction should be thought of as a permanent state of brain pathology. The idea that once an addict, always an addict sort of encapsulates this idea that addiction might be best represented as a disease state. But I'm going to argue today that this is probably not the best way for us to be approaching addiction or to be thinking about addiction. And I'm going to suggest that there's an alternative way to think of addiction more as a disorder of reward and memory pathways in your brain. Now, some of the implications of this model of addiction suggest that addiction is rather a plastic series of brain adaptation. It's a dynamic process in the brain rather than a permanent state of brain pathology. It's something that we can reverse. And finally, this idea that addiction might be controlled by specific molecular mechanisms in the brain that can actually take you from a healthy, non-addicted state to an addicted state. Okay, so the well-known addiction cycle. All drugs of abuse begin by producing very strong rewarding effects. In my, field of, in my field of study, we look at the rewarding effects and the addictive properties of opiate class drugs. So this includes drugs like heroin, morphine, and more recently, prescription narcotics. And we've had a tsunami of addictions related to drugs like Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, costing us billions of dollars, not to mention the horrendous social costs associated with addiction to these substances. Now, if we take these drugs over an extended period of time, what happens is we start developing adaptations in our brain. Changes in the brain happen in terms of our neurochemistry, the molecular substrates controlling these pathways, and even structural differences in various brain regions. Finally, we develop psychological and physiological dependence on the drug after a period of exposure to the drug of abuse. Now, this is especially true with opiate class drugs. We have this very strong physiological dependence syndrome that develops with opiate class drugs. Now, once the drug's taken away from us, we almost inevitably are going to go through a period of withdrawal, and that's accompanied by these very strong feelings of craving. You've got to get this drug back into your system to alleviate those feelings of withdrawal that you're experiencing. Now, finally, sort of the fourth part of this chain, and I'm going to argue is actually extremely important and one that's been underlooked for a long time, is the importance of memory-induced relapse. So if I were to inject myself with heroin right now and experience these profound, rewarding effects, and then I forgot about it in 20 minutes, chances are I'm not going to become addicted. What happens when we experience the rewarding effects of a drug of abuse? Our brain forms associations between those effects of the drug and all of the environmental cues. So for example, someone that was addicted to heroin and has been clean for 10, even 15 years, walking down the street, they see some sort of cue in their environment that re-triggers those addiction memories, and they fall right back into relapse. So you can see when we look at it in terms of this chain of events, to effectively treat addiction, we need to break at least one of these links. So in a nutshell, we can sort of think of addiction as being importantly controlled by reward systems in the brain and memory systems in the brain. Now, in terms of explaining addiction, 
um, based on many years of animal-based research and clinical research as well, there were two sort of general theories of addiction that were sort of popular at the time when I began this sort of research about 15, 20 years ago. One set of theories were the dopamine reward theories. And this was based on the idea that almost every single drug of abuse activates dopamine drugs. You get this release of dopamine in your brain. So logically, we thought that, OK, drugs of abuse activate dopamine. So that's why we become addicted. We activate our dopamine system, and that's why we keep taking drugs. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, theories sort of focus more on the darker side of the addiction process, withdrawal. And these sorts of theories suggested that the reason we keep taking drugs of abuse is because we go through withdrawal. And we need to seek out those drugs in our environment to alleviate those unpleasant feelings of withdrawal that we're experiencing. So when you think about these theories for a second, you sort of realize that there's some obvious problems with both of them. In terms of dopamine, well, as the years went by, we realized that dopamine's not as simple as we thought. Dopamine's more, more complicated. So for example, dopamine is activated even during unpleasant experiences. The other problem with the theory is that it does a good job of explaining why we take drugs in the first place, but we know that when we continue taking drugs of abuse, their rewarding effects tend to decline over time. Even the dopamine response can sometimes get lower and lower. So how does it account for why we continue taking drugs of abuse for years and years and years? Now on the other side of the equation, withdrawal-based theories do a good job of explaining why we fall into a relapse to addiction, but they don't do such a good job of explaining why we start taking drugs of abuse in the first place. So an obvious question is, is there some sort of link between the brain mechanisms that control these early rewarding effects of drugs and these later effects of withdrawal? And I want to present this idea of an addiction switch that can essentially serve as a, a, a mechanism to account for the transition from the healthy, non-addictive brain state to the addictive brain state. We know that addiction fundamentally changes the brain. I talked about a couple of those changes. They happen at the molecular level, or chemical level, the structural level. And more importantly, looking beyond the brain, addiction fundamentally changes the self. It changes your personality. It changes your cognition. It changes your behavior. And anyone who has watched a loved one go through the horrible effects of addiction, one of the things that stands out in your mind is you remember how much that person's personality changes while, the, while they're under the influence of the drug of abuse. Now, in terms of opiates, one of the most addictive drugs that are potentially available, we knew a couple important things about opiates that suggested that there might be some sort of switching mechanism going on between the addictive effects of opiates. We knew that in the naive state, so before you became addicted to opiates, the effects of opiates could be mediated through a dopamine-independent pathway. So you don't need dopamine to experience the rewarding effects of opiates when you're first starting out taking the drugs. Obviously, in the naive state, there's an absence of withdrawal mechanisms in the brain. There's a very minimal amount of molecular changes that are taking place. But then we looked at the effects of opiates in the addicted state, and we saw a profound difference. So first of all, we noticed that the rewarding effects of opiates, once you're addicted to opiates, activate the dopamine system. So you need dopamine have a switch to a dopamine system. There's very strong feelings of withdrawal and craving. There's obviously profound molecular alterations in various brain reward pathways that are very important. So the question that was posed when I actually began looking at this question about, about 15 years ago, back at the University of Toronto, was whether or not we can find this elusive hypothetical switching mechanism in the brain that controls this transition from a non-addicted state to an addicted state. So without going through the minutia and the years of research that led to these conclusions, what we were able to find was that when we focused on an area of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, neuroanatomists like coming up with these unpronounceable words, but we're just going to call it the VTA for the sake of simplicity. This is an area in the middle part of your brain, sort of the base of your brain, and it contains the dopamine system. And it's very important for drugs of abuse because almost all drugs of abuse produce their effects through the VTA. So in a very uh, simplified uh, explanation of this, what we found was that GABA-A receptors, which is a type of inhibitory receptor located in that area of the brain, was actually able to serve as a molecular switching mechanism between a non-addicted state and an addicted state. 
So normally you can think of the GABA A receptor as controlling the bioelectrical properties of a neuron. They control whether a neuron is on or off. And remarkably what we found was that in the non-addicted state, the GABA A receptor acted normally. It produced inhibitory signals to the neuron. It shut down neurons. But once we looked at an addicted brain, the function of the GABA A receptor switched to an excitatory state. So essentially, we're looking at a, a mechanism that controls reward signaling for a non-addicted brain reward pathway versus a system that is switched on in the addicted state and transfers reward signals through an addiction brain reward pathway. So that's great. We found this hypothetical switching mechanism in the brain. But remember that I said that addiction is more than reward. We also need to experience memory. Memory is a very critical component of addiction. So for example, as I mentioned before, we need to form these associative memories in our brain in order to continue that addiction cycle. And we next look at an area of the brain called the basal lateral amygdala. And another one of these unpronounceable terms, we're just going to call it the BLA. Now this is an area of the brain located in your temporal lobes. And it's extremely important for your ability to form associative memories between the effects of drugs of abuse and their related environmental cues. So we looked at this region of the brain called the BLA to see if this might serve as a memory switch between the non-addicted state and the addicted state. And what we found was that in the non-addicted brain, the ability to form opiate addiction reward memories depended on a receptor substrate called the D1. And it modulated a downstream molecule we're just going to call it ERK. So a non-dependent drug-naive molecular mechanism in the BLA controlling addiction memories in the naive state. We looked at the addicted brain, and what we found was that there was a switch between this D1 receptor mechanism to a completely different brain reward mechanism for the formation of addiction memories. And now we were dealing with a system that relied on a type of receptor called the D2 receptor and an entirely different molecular downstream signaling pathway called CAM kinase 2. So again, just like in terms of processing the rewarding effects of drugs of abuse, when we look at the difference between the addicted state and the non-addicted state, the ability to form drug addiction memories is also under the control of a discrete switching mechanism. And the really cool thing about this is that we were able to target those molecules in the amygdala and switch the brain back and forth from an addicted state to a non-addicted state. So this is really exciting because it suggests that instead of thinking of addiction, as this chronic, permanent, irreversible state, we can actually go into these brain areas, we can target these molecular pathways, and we can actually switch the brain from a non-addicted state to an addicted state and back and forth. So this really calls into the question the need for us to develop a new paradigm for conceptualizing what's really going on in addiction. We know that in the non-dependent state, we're dealing with an entirely different set of molecular and neuroanatomical mechanisms that control how you perceive the rewarding effects of a drug like heroin, for example. But once you become addicted to that drug, something switches in your brain. There's a switch to entirely separate molecular and neuronal systems in the brain that control how you perceive the rewarding effects of drugs. So this is really thinking of addiction much more in terms of a plastic, dynamic process that allows us to go back and forth between these different states. So where do we go from here? I think one of the most important questions to ask is to go back to the beginning and address the issue of whether or not the disease model of addiction has really served us well. And I'm going to argue that no, it hasn't really been an effective model for us in terms of our ability to understand what's going on in the brain, and more importantly, in terms of developing effective treatments for addiction. Because remember, after many decades and many thousands and thousands of research papers from all sorts of disciplines, we have yet to develop a truly effective treatment for dealing with the devastating effects of addiction. The problem with the disease model of addiction is twofold. The first problem is that it doesn't take into account these dynamic processes that are happening in your brain as you go from a non-addicted state to an addicted state. Because I said at the outset, we think of diseases as these sort of permanent static processes as opposed to these more dynamic switching mechanisms that go on in the brain. 
The second problem is that when we use a disease model of addiction, whether we're talking about forming questions for our research or developing more effective psychotherapies or treating addiction, we tend to focus more on the effects of addiction. We focus on the symptoms of addiction instead of the underlying causes of addiction. Now, having said that, I think that there's enough evidence out there to suggest that a better way of thinking of addictions are that we're dealing with an altered but reversible state of the brain. It's controlled by a series of molecular mechanisms that control the switch from a non-addictive state to an addictive state. And as I said before, what's most exciting about this is that it allows us to go into the brain, target these molecular pathways, and potentially develop more effective pharmacotherapeutics or more effective psychotherapeutic approaches to dealing with addiction by appreciating some of these dynamic mechanisms. So, as I said at the outset, uh, one of the important things about addiction in terms of understanding how it processes the rewarding effects of drugs of abuse is this idea that we can identify a switch and ultimately turn off the effects of addiction in the brain.